Uh, we have also received notice from the Minister of Finance that he wishes to make a statement. So I would now invite the Minister of Finance to make a statement. I say I'm happy to take a question first from Ms. Ogden, if, if the discretion of the Chair allows it. Uh, Can Corla, I'd like to provide an update on the Executive's financial response to the coronavirus crisis. On the 9th of April, I advised that the Executive had received foreign consequences of some £1 billion, pounds, and we agreed allocations to departments of £733 million. In addition, the following funding was held centrally. £150 million for PPE, £40 million pounds for business support and £10 million for vulnerable people. A further £101 million was set aside for consideration at a later date. Since then, the Executive has received an additional barn of consequences of £213 million, bringing this total to some £1.2 billion. The Executive has also agreed that £30 million of resource deal, which has been freed up by the reinstatement of confidence supply funding, will be used for a COVID-19 response. This response is continuously evolving and the Executive has been reacting at speed. Further allocations were set out in the 2020-21 budget document laid before the Assembly on 30 April. This included setting aside some £95 million for support to the transport sector, £22 million for support for charities and £49 million for support for NHS workforce costs. The Hardship Fund for Micro-Businesses has used the £40 million held centrally for business support. £6.75 million of support has gone to hospices, using funding for the £22 million set aside for charities. £15.5 million has been allocated to the Department of Communities for a scheme targeted at charities. Using the £95 million set aside for transport, a support package has been agreed in conjunction with Treasury and the Department for Transport in London to help airports and ferry operators maintain connectivity and key supply routes. The executive contribution is currently estimated at 3.3 and 2.2 million, respectively. 30 million has been allocated to the Department for Infrastructure towards funding pressures relating to the loss of income, in particular those faced by TransLink. This builds on an extra £20 million allocated to TransLink in the 2020-21 budget. There remains some £59.5 million available for transport, which will be allocated at a future date. The £10 million held centrally for support for vulnerable people has been allocated to the Department for Communities for the Supporting People programme. A total estimated cost of this support is some £14 million, and the Communities Minister is to be commended for the measures she has taken to fund almost £4 million of this. This is an important programme which supports approximately 19,000 vulnerable individuals living independently. Of the £150 million held for PPE, £61.3 million has been allocated to the Department of Health and £4.9 million to the Department of Justice to ensure our frontline staff have the equipment they need. There remains almost £84 million held for future requirements. The £49 million consequential received in respect of NHS workforce costs has been allocated to the Department of Health in full. A number of additional allocations were also agreed by the Executive yesterday. These include £25 million to support farmers and the horticulture industry. Further detail on this scheme will be announced by the Minister for Agriculture in due course. A further £3.8 million has been provided to DERA for waste management, treatment and disposal. I am also pleased we will be able to provide £20.3 million to the Department of Communities to support local councils which have delivered vital services during the COVID-19 crisis. Members may also be aware of the difficult situation facing sub-teachers, unable to be furloughed and facing considerable loss of income. The Minister for Education and I wrote to the Treasury asking for substitute teachers here to be furloughed, as happened with their counterparts in England. That request was rejected. So the, Minister, uh, sorry, the Executive has stepped up, and to his credit, the Minister for Education has found £8 million from within his own budget, and I am pleased to provide an additional £4 million, bringing the total fund for substitute teachers to £12 million. The Executive also agreed to provide £1.4 million for the Department of Economy to support students facing hardship. It is hoped that the Department for the Economy will be able to consider topping this up from within their own budget. Mr Speaker, we are very grateful for the exceptional dedication shown by health workers during this pandemic. And that is why the Deputy First Minister gave a commitment that health staff would not suffer a financial loss as a result of the strike action they took earlier this year. And I am pleased to make £1.6 million available to the Department of Health to honour that commitment. Taking all of this into account, the Executive has £119.9 million available for allocation. It has been agreed that this will be used to extend the support currently provided to businesses through the business rate system. 
In March, I announced a £99 million pound scheme uh, involving three-month rates holiday for all businesses. Had we adopted the English model, 60 per cent of businesses' premises would be paying rates today. I said at the time that time would be used to develop a new scheme targeted at the hardest-hit business sectors. The University of Ulster Economic Policy Centre was commissioned to assist my department in developing that scheme. I would like to thank Gareth Hetherington, who produced such a helpful report in a very short space of time. With the executive only now emerging from lockdown, the economy is still in the early stage of recovery. Business and trade unions are still in the process of ensuring that the economy can operate in a way that is safe for workers and the general public. I have therefore decided to extend the rates holiday for all businesses for another month, that is, until the 31st of July. The rates holiday will then move into its targeted phase, supporting sectors hardest hit by the pandemic for the rest of the financial year. This includes the hospitality, tourism and leisure sectors. All pubs, hotels, eating out venues, guest houses, campsites, sports facilities, tourist venues, cinemas and entertainment venues will pay no rates this financial year. Retail businesses, small local shops, large departmental stores, both high streets and out-of-town retail, will pay no rates this financial year. The exception is medium to large food stores and off-licenses, which have continued to trade, albeit with higher costs. These food retailers have really stepped up during this period, opening their stores, making adjustments to ensure safety for customers and staff, and we owe them a huge gratitude. I also want to thank the workers in these food stores who have continued to provide a vital service during this difficult time. The availability of childcare providers is severe, severely impacted by their difficulty in maintaining social distancing. Therefore, they too will receive 100% rate relief until the 31st of March 2021. Our airports will continue to be adversely impacted for a considerable time to come, and it is vital that they are maintained through this crisis and are still able to function after the pandemic passes. That is why Belfast City, Belfast International and City of Derry will also receive 100% rate relief until 31 March 2021. Together, this represents a £213 million rate supports package for business. It brings the total support for businesses from rates, relief and grants to over £700 million, demonstrating the Executive's determination to protect livelihoods and jobs. Last Concordia, the cost for business rates support exceeds the, the funding currently available. There are a number of potential sources of additional funding, and I am confident that this overcommitment will be met. However, we can no longer wait. Businesses need certainty now, and for that reason, I am today announcing the rates relief for the rest of the financial year. I would like to thank my staff from across the Department who have been working so hard on a number of fronts, including developing this support package. I appreciate that I have presented a lot of information for uh, Assembly colleagues to consider, and to assist with that, I have attached a table to the written version of this statement, which has summarised the allocations agreed. I trust that you will find that helpful. And now I will invite members to, uh, to ask concise questions to the Minister for a period of one hour. Some uh, additional leverage is given to the Chair of the Finance Committee, and I now call Steve Aiken. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker. I would like to thank the Minister for his statement, and thank you very much indeed for our earlier discussion we had today. Uh, speaking as Chair of the Finance Committee, we welcome the allocation of the $1.2 billion over the last six weeks from our Government. It is great to see the real benefits of being part of our United Kingdom today. In particular, may I thank the Department and the Minister for listening to the concerns of our Northern Ireland businesses for the continued rates relief and also for the extension to key sectors such as our vital hospitality, tourism and leisure sectors out to the end of the financial year. May we also welcome the extension of rates relief to our airports until March 2021 as well. I also note that 60, that 60 million that is available centrally for further support to our transport sector and that may indeed be needed to restore and maintain vital air and sea routes. And yes, Mr Deputy Speaker, I am coming to the questions. As we have already heard, additional support to our councils is also very welcome. However, as the year progresses, our councils will indeed face additional increasing pressures. I would particularly like to ask the Minister to commit, along with other departments, to provide clarity to all the businesses that are affected by the changes in rates relief, both indicating clearly those that will benefit from the, from the benefit and also for those who will not. 
And, Minister, if you have the opportunity, could you also comment on whether local newspapers are likely to get some additional support as well because of that? So finally, speaking as our party's finance spokesman, may I say that we welcome the support for businesses, for the vulnerable continued support to our vital NHS and our transport sector. There is a clearly a willingness to recognise that this crisis we are in. But last week you heard from the First Minister that we would see an economic recovery plan. We have not question? seen that yet. But our party has asked repeatedly for a COVID recovery plan to be the main programme for government focus. Can I ask the Minister when we are likely to see a recovery plan that meets all these needs for the people of Northern Ireland? Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Minister. Uh, can I thank the uh, Chair for his comments? Uh, uh, and just to say, the, uh, of course, there's such a, an enormous variety of businesses, and we are making a distinction in terms of retail between uh, the medium to large food sector uh, and other retail. Uh, and, uh, of course, there's, there's clarity, uh, I suppose, for all businesses, in that we're including all businesses up to the 31st of July. Uh, but I will ask the Department then to be more definitive in terms of which businesses then are included beyond that date to the end of the financial year uh, and which are not. It's impossible to go into the, the huge variety of businesses that we have here. And that includes newspapers. I know that newspapers, local uh, newspapers have been lobbying us all uh, in terms of the precarious position that they find themselves in. Uh, and I'll, I'll make some inquiries in the Department as to whether they become part of that uh, ongoing package beyond the 31st of July. Of course, if they're paying rates, uh, they're included, and they've had, they will effectively have had a four-month holiday up to that point. In terms of the recovery plan, it's a responsibility for the Department of the Economy, uh, and the D Economy Minister has signalled to the Executive that she is moving towards uh, being in a position to share with the Executive uh, uh, some, some uh, thoughts and some uh, material in relation to a recovery plan. Uh, I can say that the the study that we did in relation to the impact on businesses that we commissioned with the University of Ulster uh, uh, is now available on the department website, and I have recommended that study to executive colleagues as well, because I think that will inform any recovery plan which the executive will develop. I call Paul Free. And, uh, I welcome this decision today. I have been calling up for it for so long. I think it is a no-brainer. I think it is the difference between businesses existing and not existing. One business in my constituency is due to make a loss of 200,000. Their rate burden is 170,000. So this is the difference between existing and not. Uh, the Minister has been pretty good at spending Barnet consequential money. The cost of the business rate support exceeds the funding currently available. Can the Minister give us uh, by how much and what work has been conducted to see what needs to be changed or stopped uh, with regards to the normal budget functions. Households have, have made sacrifices on a daily basis. When will they see this executive make difficult decisions and make sacrifices themselves? Well, can I say the executive is making difficult decisions. The decision to overcommit is a difficult decision. Uh, but nonetheless, it's a vital decision to support businesses. People seem to think the only difficult decisions an executive faces are whether to charge households for additional services. Uh, and if you don't make those decisions, somehow you don't step up to the mark. Uh, difficult decision is to try and provide support to vulnerable people and communities at this time and to overcommit uh, in relation to that. The, I, I'm con confident that the level of overcommitment is manageable. It is significant for the executive. I think it's, uh, it's less than £100 million, but there are business grants are due to close tomorrow or forecast to cost less than the original estimate, and that will go a considerable way to addressing that shortfall. Uh, we have also commissioned a reprioritisation exercise across all departments, which will allow the executive to target funding where it is needed most. So it will be a combination uh, of, of some of the money which we have allocated, which is unlikely to be spent, uh, and ensure that departments, as we have said, uh, all along uh, will not spend, uh, of course, departments have additional costs in terms of responding to COVID-19, but there are other, uh, other areas in which they won't spend money, and we need to ensure that the executive's priorities, and this is a significant priority in terms of supporting business to try and ensure business gets through uh, this pandemic and out the other side, is met by the collective effort of all of the executive ministers. I call Karen Mullen. Now, good last Concordia. And I thank the Minister for his statement, which will be very wel welcome today across many sectors, and in particular the childcare sector um, uh, will greatly welcome the rates holiday relief, uh, who are very much struggling at this time. Minister, uh, today the day-to-day -to -day sub-teachers will also be very relieved 
For a long time now, they have waited um, with bills piling up. I therefore welcome the intervention by yourself and providing funds to ensure these teachers will receive financial assistance. assistance. And I would ask at this stage, have you had any idea when those, payment, those, those teachers would be likely to receive the payments? Well, can I say yes, I, I'm, I'm very much aware of the, the hardship that uh, some teachers were facing. Uh, myself and the Education Minister wrote to the, jointly wrote to the Treasury on the 29th of April to request access to the uh, coronavirus job retention scheme. Uh, the member would probably know that uh, sub-teachers in England uh, and are uh, provided in the main through agencies, uh, which meant that they were able to access the furloughing uh, scheme uh, through the coronavirus job retention scheme. Uh, sub-teachers here operate on a more ad hoc basis, basically on a list uh, which is contacted uh, on a less structured way and are not part of agencies uh, and as a consequence then they uh, were unable to access that. So we did press for a number of weeks with Treasury uh, to try and get uh, some degree of support for sub-teachers uh, and we've been pushing that case, both myself and the Education Minister, with Treasury. We only really got final word at the latter end of last week uh, that Treasury were refusing to support our sub-teachers in that fashion and that did present an inequality in terms of how sub-teachers were dealt with in, uh, in Britain. Uh, but nonetheless, the, uh, we, we decided then if that, uh, if that effort wasn't successful that we would attempt to fund the uh, scheme that the Department for Education had identified through our own resources. And in fairness, the Department of Education came up with £8 million uh, of that from their own budget. And the executive agreed on my proposition to add a further four million to that budget. So that means there's 12 million pounds to support sub-teachers until the end of June. Now, the, uh, the speed at which that money can be allocated is now a matter for the Department for Education, because, uh, as I say, it's a mixture of the funding they have provided and the funding that we have provided. And this scheme is now approved by the executive. So it will be up to the Department of Education to get that out to the sub-teachers as quickly as they can. I call Matthew O'Toole. Uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, um, I welcome uh, several of the allocations, all the allocations in a sense made today, um, particularly money that's gone to TransLink. I'm sure my colleague to my right will be welcoming the announcement on substitute teachers. Um, in relation to the overcommitment made on business rates, while business rates is completely critical, the reason why it's critical is because it's the only politically acceptable revenue raising tool that the executive has. Can I ask the Minister to agree with me that we need a proper joined up fiscal and economic response to this crisis? We need it from his department and the economy department. It needs to be joined up and it needs to avoid harebrained schemes like the one which is seeing his department return £2 million this year thanks to a decision made by Sammy Wilson nearly a decade ago to subsidise non existent flights to North question. America. School, can I ask him, can he come up with a joined up fiscal and economic response to this crisis? Well, I'm, ha I'm happy to do that and make every effort to do it. Of course, that, that uh, joined-up response is responsibility for the executive as a whole, although I have a responsibility for making propositions. Uh, I know he has been raising the issue of the APD, I have to, and that money is removed from the block grant. It's not something that we pay out. But that is in, that's there, I suppose, to ensure that if it is possible and that there would be every effort to attract long-haul flights back, then that this it's an incentive to offer long-haul flights. If it's not there, then there's no incentive to offer them. Uh, so it's, uh, it, it is, uh, had, had been concluded by previous executives that it was worth uh, maintaining that particular arrangement uh, on the hope that long-haul flights could be returned. Uh, I, I know there is a much greater traffic through Dublin now uh, for most of the people on the island, uh, and whether the executive decide to change, uh, perhaps the Department for Infrastructure would have an influence there, decide to change their approach to that. But that was the purpose for which APD was, was held. In overall terms of executive spend, it's not, the, it's not the biggest amount of money, although by anybody's reckoning, over £2 million is significant. I call Andrew Muir. Thank you very much, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his statement. I think it's vital that this place and the Executive does all it can to support both people and businesses to get through the current crisis and the impending recession. Um, the rates actions are to be welcomed. Obviously, there are concerns around the overcommitment around that. I think there is going to need to be further reassurances given in terms of how we are going to manage that. Um, my question sort of touches upon some of the other issues that have been raised. Is that there is a need not just for the rates thing, but for that to be coupled with actions by the Department of the Economy to support businesses getting through this, and whether the Minister has got any idea about the scale of that financial um, uh, commitment that is going to be required, and uh, whether we will be able 
people to assist businesses through further grant schemes to get through this, because rates is not going to be the only thing that's going to be required to assist businesses to survive this recession. Well, can I say that I mean this this announcement today, coupled with the the grant scheme, I think is uh, over 300 uh, million from the Department of the Economy. Uh, in relation to grant schemes and, and coupled to this scheme and the 40 million that we've set aside uh, for business hardship schemes, uh, all come to a, a, in excess of 700 million pounds with the support that this executive has provided uh, for business. So it's a significant uh, injection in trying to keep our, our business. At the same time, the primary responsibility of the executive is to keep the public safe, uh, to keep uh, people alive. And so we have obviously invested very heavily in relation to the health response to the coronavirus, and we have responded, I suppose, in three broad areas in terms of our COVID spend, have been health, supporting business, and supporting the most vulnerable in society. Uh, and so that we have had to try and spread the money across those areas to try and ensure uh, that, that that would be effective. Uh, clearly, in relation to rates, uh, the projection of the cost of this is based on the full intake of that rate, because this isn't money we're spending out, it's money we're not collecting. Uh, and uh, I, I think we could safely assume that not all businesses would be in a position to pay those rates uh, towards the end uh, of the rest of this uh, financial year. So that's estimated as if all businesses were going to continue to pay that. Uh, but clearly businesses are going to struggle to come out of this, uh, even those where restrictions are lifted. And that's why we targeted this, where we've given all businesses four month rates all day, we targeted this in relation to those uh, which on the analysis that was uh, provided for us uh, have suffered and may well continue to suffer beyond the end of the financial year uh, in terms of, you know, particularly the hospitality sector, we're not going to see packed pubs and packed restaurants and filled hotels for some time to come, I would imagine. Uh, and so I don't doubt that those sectors will need continued support, but we can only do what we can with what we have at this moment in time. And we also want to give some certainty to business in terms of what they're facing into. So I think an announcement today in relation to the rates extension to the end of the financial year will be welcomed uh, by those businesses. Uh, but we, we are absolutely certain, as he is, that this isn't people out of the woods by any uh, stretch, uh, even with this support. Members, there are some 13 additional members who wish to ask the question, and I would ask for everyone's cooperation in order that they will ask their question and receive an answer. And I call Gary Middleton. Thank you, uh, Deputy Speaker, and can I thank the Minister for a statement and welcome the funding measures uh, that he has uh, put in place. Uh, going forward, like many members, we're concerned about the recovery phase and ensuring that uh, we can get our job creation back and our economy back to where it was. Uh, what conversations have you had, Minister, with the Chancellor to uh, discuss an economic stimulus package going forward? Well, we're continuing to engage with the Treasury. I have a conversation later today with the Chief Secretary to the Treasury. Uh, I, I do so with the other uh, finance ministers from Scotland and Wales. Uh, and, and as part of those conversations, we talk about some of the packages the Treasury have offered to date, like the job retention scheme and uh, self-employed scheme, uh, and some of the questions and anomalies that arise, including the uh, identification issues with the self-employed scheme. Uh, we've been pressing on that matter uh, with HMRC as well. Uh, so we continue to raise issues with some of the schemes and some of the, the challenges that they present. But we also are discussing uh, how we attempt to get the economy back on a stable foot and on the other side of that. And, and there's nobody underestimating the challenge that, that is going to be for all of us. Uh, uh, and so we will continue to discuss that. And I'll be hoping that there's further support in relation to that. But I have to say we have no indication of, as yet of, of what that might amount to. I call Declan McLear. Um, obviously, as Chair of the Agriculture, Environment and Rural Affairs Committee and representative of a mini rural constituency, I would like to take the opportunity to welcome the £25 million in the uh, Minister's announcement for uh, farmers and the agriculture industry, or horticulture industry. Uh, does the Minister agree that um, uh, this funding should be directed towards uh, prim primary producers who are, um, who are most in need, particularly those whose incomes, annual incomes are so low that they will not be able to gain any benefit from the self-employed income support scheme and the other schemes that have been announced? Graham Haggard. I am very much aware, as a rural representative uh, myself, of the uh, impact uh, that this has had on the farming community. Uh, restricted access to markets, uh, drop at market price, uh, could result in many in the industry going out of business as the market value dropped below the production costs. And that's something that is, is very much a feature across sectors. And obviously, there are particular issues in the horticulture sector at this time of the year. 
uh, given that this is the, the time that they would make uh, most of their uh, income. Uh, so that is a, a situation in which obviously this £25 million that we have uh, given to the Department of Tadera to try and deal with those sectors and we look forward to seeing the details of the announcement of the Minister's scheme in relation to all of that and I'm sure as Chair of the Committee uh, they will uh, analyse that and, and, and interrogate officials and the Minister himself in relation to how that will roll out but there's no doubt that the farming community are suffering as all, are all other businesses and they haven't been able to access some of the other support measures that have been there for businesses. This hopefully will go some way to try and address that but I have no doubt that they will continue to struggle in the time ahead. I call Jonathan Buckley. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. And again, I would like to broadly welcome this statement, in particular uh, the funding allocated to those key businesses and the rates extension. I think that is essential and vital and a lifeline to those businesses. But I'm delighted to see, on the back of what has been said in relation to farming, the backbone of our community, the farmers that have now received a financial package of £25 million. This is to be welcomed. Uh, can I ask the Minister, has there been any detailed discussions, if indeed a further financial package is needed for our farmers at this time, but also, uh, what sectors and specifically has there been any conversations that have been mentioned uh, with the Minister of Agriculture at this stage? Well, uh, there hasn't been a discussion on a further package. I mean, we have to get this one out on the ground first to see, see the impact of it. Uh, I have no doubt, uh, coming from a farm background myself, farmers would never say no to any further support that might be available to them. Uh, but there have been particular conversations around the horticulture and the dairy sectors, but the, the, part, uh, the Minister has on a number of occasions advised the executive as a whole about the challenges facing all of the sectors uh, within farming and uh, the need for support measures for that. He has now been in touch with my own department to engaged in terms of what type of scheme that he wants to see brought forward. We will provide the funding for it. He will, in, uh, I think, in the near future, announce the details of that and where he, he wants to see that going and who is eligible to apply for it. And obviously, as I say, the, the defining factor about a lot of these measures that we have introduced as a result of what we call COVID spend is to try and get people to through the, the, the near to medium term future. This isn't about long haul, this isn't because we don't have the resources to do long term in relation to businesses. The further ex extension we have now is the end of the financial year and that's only for some business. For others we have given out supports, the £10,000 grants, the £25,000 grants are all to get, try and get people through the immediate phase. And similarly with farmers, uh, uh, this scheme on, is, I'm sure is predicated on trying to get people through the immediate challenges they face uh, in the hope that the economy and activity will, will pick up in, in the nearer term and then we'll be able to determine what ongoing support is needed. I call Kiva Archibald. I'm Leish Kankoya, um, and I thank the Minister for his statement. Very much welcome the, the 1.4 million towards the Student Hardship Fund, and I hope the Economy Minister will, will top that up as well. The Minister will know I've been highlighting that issue for, for many weeks. Um, the rates relief to being extended to, will be very welcome news to businesses. Over 700 million has now been directed to support um, businesses, including the grants, um, and that is hugely important. The criteria for the Hardship the Fund um, was published at the weekend, and there was an expectation social enterprises and sole traders would be included in that. Um, obviously, they are facing real financial difficulties, despondent at not being included. Does the Minister agree that that should be addressed and those um, businesses should also get support? Yeah, I think the, uh, the, there is uh, a, a real issue with social enterprises, some of whom are charities and some who aren't. Uh, and I know there has been uh, some exchange between the economy uh, department and uh, department for communities as to where that responsibility lays. I would like to see clarity for those in the social enterprise sector as to where they can access support. Not only are they legitimate and genuine businesses in their own right, but they perform a very important social function in assisting people who otherwise perhaps might not gain employment or might not gain some of the services that they, they provide. Uh, I think they're a shining example of what can be done in terms of business and interaction with the community and, and, and people who are uh, in that not-for-profit uh, sense. So uh, I, I sincerely hope that there will be uh, a clarity between both those departments as to where this sector fits. And I know we will continue to engage them to try and make sure that they don't feel left out from any of these packages. I call Daniel, Daniel McCrossan. Thank you, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker. And I too would like to welcome the Minister's statement and thank him for bringing it to the House. Uh, Minister, there is much in that statement that will be welcomed by many, but in particular many will know the strong campaign that we have led for sub-teachers and the plight that they have faced over the last eight weeks, nine weeks, and the uncertainty around paying bills 
uh, putting food on their tables. It was a very stressful time. I'm just wondering, Minister, what conversations have you had with the Minister for Education as to how the scheme will be rolled out? Uh, was there a criteria discussed in reaching uh, the overall figure of £12 million, and how quickly will it be allocated to these people who are suffering at this time? Well, I think we were all uh, very much aware of the, uh, the plight of sub-teachers, because uh, I'm, I'm sure there's not a member here uh, that, that wasn't lobbied uh, in relation to that, myself included. Uh, and we, in the first instance, uh, I think this would be our responsibility is to try and ensure fairness in how they were treated. Uh, and if sub-teachers could be furloughed uh, in, in, in England, then uh, quite clearly the first approach, and I appreciate that, that the length of time that it took us to get a, a proper response from Treasury added to the stress faced by sub-teachers, but we wanted to ensure that if there was an opportunity to get that uh, equality in terms of treatment through uh, the Treasury, then that we, we would do that, and both myself and the Education Minister pursued that. Uh, w once we were quite clear at the end of last week that that wasn't going to happen, we quickly moved uh, to, to uh, agree between us uh, the amount of money that was required. The detail of that scheme, how it's worked out and how quickly it will be paid will be matters for the Education Department and the Education Minister. Uh, but I'm, I'm pleased, as I'm sure he is, that we have the funding available and we want to ensure that there is no more uncertainty or, or stress for those who are in that category uh, and that we quickly get the level of support to them. I call Robbie Butler. Thank you, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker. Um, Mr. Deputy Speaker, sorry, elevated there. Uh, I thank the Minister for his statement today, and there's much to be grateful for, in particular the, the sub-teacher payments, but there does seem to be an omission, Minister. You may be aware that it is Mental Health Awareness Week, and within New Decade, New Approach, there was a commitment by this Executive and this uh, Assembly to deliver a mental health action plan uh, by the end of April. Can the Minister detail any uh, amount of money that he has allocated to the Department of Health to action this? And if not, can he make a commitment today to say that? I think that the money is in around £2.5 million pounds, uh, that is needed. Well, I, I, I probably would need to go back to the budget statement to try and, 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 and figure out that this is COVID response money. Uh, and quite clearly, a lot of issues which the executive had intended to be dealing with and set itself a time frame for dealing with, including uh, mental health, including dealing with the recommendations of the RHI inquiry, including Brexit, uh, remember that, uh, that clearly have been interrupted by the need to quickly respond to what was a very uh, serious, life-threatening and, and, and threat to society in terms of this pandemic. So some of that has gone on the back foot, and I realise one of the consequences of dealing with this pandemic has probably been an increase in mental health stress as well. So I, I, I probably would have to defer to your own colleague and my executive colleague, the Minister for Health, uh, to advise us. I know there is a commitment across the executive. That's why we agreed uh, to a cross-party team of ministers to look at it. It wasn't just confined to the Department of Health. Uh, I, I don't know for certain in terms of the allocation to it. It wasn't part of this particular uh, series of allocations, but I'm happy to get the, uh, the members some figures. And clearly, uh, it, it will be one of the big consequences of society's experience of this pandemic will be an increase in, in stress in terms of mental health, and we want to make sure that we can meet that as best we can. I call Chris Little. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Uh, Childcare and education will play a vital role in the new society that we must build further to COVID-19, so I welcome the 100 per cent rate relief for childcare providers to March 2021 and indeed the long overdue payment for sub-teachers announced today. Can I ask the Finance Minister what explanation the UK Government gave for refusing the furlough of Northern Ireland sub-teachers, how much the sub-teachers will receive and when they will receive it? Uh, well, the, the difference in approach, and, and I appreciate that uh, Treasury has, has a lot on its plate at the moment, uh, the difference in approach was that uh, they have been very reluctant to furlough public sector workers on this. There's a very clear demonstration of a loss of income to whatever sector they worked in as a consequence of the not, and that they aren't be able to be redeployed in other areas. The sub-teachers in England uh, come through an agency, so in effect they have a private employer who was able to access furlough uh, money on their behalf. Sub-teachers here, as he will know, uh, come on a much more ad hoc uh, basis where they essentially schools have lists of people that they can call up as and when required. The, the, as my understanding of the scheme was, because it's an education department scheme, it was intended to have a, a record of the, I suppose, the average days. That so, some people might only work once a week, others might be working three or four days a week, uh, and, and to have some sort of an assessment based on the frequency of employment that they have over a period of time and try and make an allocation based on what their likely intake would have been 
from March right through to June. So that's, that's my understanding of the basis scheme. The Education Minister, I'm sure, uh, will be able to assist you with more detail in relation to that. I call Claire Sugden. Uh, thank you, Deputy Speaker. Um, thank you, Minister. Um, this is a good statement, and I think um, will please many who have been fighting that, uh, namely uh, sub-teachers' student hardship, I think is an important one too, and the rates hold the extension to the year for targeted businesses. On that last point, could I ask the Minister if he would confirm? Um, he's outlined a number of businesses, including guest houses, um, Childcare providers. Can I ask the Minister to confirm if that will include those providers who operate within a domestic rates property? So, will they be able to um, avail of uh, a, a rates holiday on domestic rates? So, for example, guest houses tend to be their homes, so they don't tend to pay domestic or non domestic rates, they pay domestic rates. Will he extend that to include all businesses? It's not quite clear in his statement. Thank you. Well, I, I, there was, if guest houses were able to access the uh, the 10 or 25,000 case schemes, then they would have been considered commercial properties or a commercial section of a residential property. If they weren't, I would think there is a difficulty with that uh, because they aren't commercially rated, therefore they can't avail of a commercial rates holiday. Uh, so I, I know there, is, there are business hardship funds. We've set aside £40 million pounds to the Department of the Economy to provide business hardship funds for, for businesses which have not been able to avail of any of the other reliefs or grants uh, that, that have been available. Uh, and so I would advise that people find they don't qualify for this to, to uh, quickly. I, I, I told that the eligibility criteria it was made available at the weekend, but I think the scheme will formally open this week at some stage. The Department for the Economy and the Minister for the Economy will have to answer for that, for that or as to when that's likely to happen. But uh, I think there would be a difficulty if people aren't paying commercial rates then to access of a commercial rates relief. But I, I, I would suggest that those businesses uh, do consider uh, looking at the business hardship fund because that is for people who have missed out on the various other schemes. I call Cahill Boylan. But, uh, last thing, Corleone, thank you, uh, Minister, for the statement. I commend the Minister. I just want to ask the Minister, uh, I welcome the, the £30 million announcement to TransLink, and that's on top of the £20 million that was allocated during the, the recent budget. Um, and I look forward to working with the Deputy Speaker and the Committee as that all rolls out and we we'll scrutinise that. But my question to the Minister is in relation to furloughed workers. Could the Minister give us an update on how public bodies have utilised the furlough scheme and has that been in, in consultation with the Union? Well, the, the responsibility of my own department is really to seek advice, uh, to seek a clearer understanding with Treasury. Initially, uh, as I said, they were very reluctant to furlough public sector workers. Uh, but clearly, if there was an opportunity uh, if our workers then they set down a number of criteria, one being that uh, there was a loss of income from them not being in, engaged in the work they were engaged in to whatever organisation employed them. There was, no, there was no ability to redeploy them elsewhere uh, and there were a set of criteria. So our, our role and responsibility in relation to this was to provide that advice to the various government departments and say if you feel uh, that there are a section of workers within your department or within your arms length body uh, that may be able to avail of this and you're, you're losing uh, money as a consequence of paying out in salaries, which you may be able to uh, acquire elsewhere, then uh, uh, by all means go and investigate this opportunity uh, and, if needs be, come back to us for advice in relation to that. So it is really up to the, the department themselves, uh, and I know some have done, uh, I think it must be communities, I imagine, have done so in relation to museum staff. Uh, I know then the councils, then, as kind of you like arms and bodies of communities, have. Uh, have furloughed a number of workers and that has saved them in terms of their wage bill uh, and the, the ongoing loss of revenue that they have. Uh, so it's really a matter for the department themselves to assess whether they have staff that fall into that category and to do the necessary consultation with those staff and their union representatives. I call Justin McNulty. Um, thank the Minister for his statement and for his answers so far. And uh, it was good to see you out uh, getting your daily exercise at the late end of the weekend there, Minister, socially distanced um, and uh, keeping healthy. Minister, I welcome the, local, uh, the, the support for local authorities, many of whom have been, seen a drop in income of up to £1 million per month. Local residents face a reduction in services and potentially uh, rate hikes. It is positive that the Council can now access the furloughing scheme. Can the Minister update the House on plans to support local councils beyond what has been announced today 
and will he, be, will he be providing security for councils to ensure that no further jobs will be lost in local authorities as a consequence of COVID-19? Well, I thank the member for his question. I did recognise him whizzing by as I was out exercising at the lake end, which would be unfamiliar to most of the rest of you. Uh, he had more hair at that stage, I think, but, uh, <laughs> uh, but I recognise him nonetheless. Uh, so, uh, can I say in relation to councils, yes, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm very clear. I have conversations with councils myself. It's the responsibility of the Department of Communities. Uh, they have responsibility for local government. Uh, and clearly, they uh, have put together a proposition and a package to us, which we've, been, we've managed to give £20 million. Uh, the Department of Communities will obviously have to bring forward the details of that scheme, how it's spread among the 11 councils, and on what basis, what it intends to do. And clearly, councils are in stress. They have been losing. Uh, have been losing a lot of revenue. Uh, they have been uh, the ability to furlough some of their staff, particularly leisure staff and other staff like that, uh, has been a, a big assistance. I know uh, has taken a significant chunk off the monthly loss uh, that the councils were experiencing. Uh, but nonetheless, they are continuing to lose money. Of course, councils like government departments won't be spending things that they would otherwise have spent on. So, quite a lot of the, for instance, community festivals that would have taken place over the summer. They will now not be investing in those because they won't be happening, uh, and so they will be able to make some savings. Uh, and I know, certainly in relation to the council that we both uh, live in, uh, have been engaging with the community side to see what's get, what projects will go ahead and what won't, and then trying to uh, see can they, they save some money themselves. So that's going to be a very difficult balancing exercise for councils. They already, I think, have uh, their rates set. Uh, so it, it, there's no doubt, uh, as I say, with. A lot of these COVID allocations, the purpose of them is to try and get people through the immediate period and into a more stable financial situation and then reassess as to what the situation is then. So I'm hoping that this will give the Council some degree of stability going forward. I hope in relation to furloughing now that it's announced to go on to October, that also gives them some relief. And, and then in terms of the savings they might make on, on, on schemes they otherwise would have spent money on over the, the, the first half of this year, then that allows them also to make some savings. I call Mark Durkin. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I was Bria Hesleshanaira for Hunyan Fragri Gajisha. Uh, there's some fantastic positive uh, news in the Minister's statement today, and that is very much welcome. And the question I'm, I'm asked should be in no way construed as a criticism uh, of the, the response thus far. Reference has been made to those businesses that have fallen through the holes in just about every safety net that has been put out there. And the Minister has alluded uh, to the hardship fund uh, to Ms Sugden in a previous answer. However, that fund in itself has criteria which is quite prohibitive. And I can think of a couple of examples of my own in my own constituency of successful, successful businesses, significant uh, employers and important service providers who have been able to avail of any assistance yet. I think of maybe someone who had been renting premises of a charity who were not registered for rates, who can't get it, whose employer, employee numbers disqualify them from a hardship fund. Can the Minister give a commitment to work with the Department for Economy to look at these businesses and establish some type of, of, of mop-up fund or, or, or final safety net to ensure that none of these businesses go to the wall completely? Well, I, I, I can absolutely assure the member I will continue to work with the Department of Economy, as we did with the 10K scheme and the 25K scheme. Uh, and this, uh, we, we, we held in reserve £40 million. And the intent was this would be a mop-up scheme to get all of the others. And I, I, I recognise what he's saying in relation to some of the criteria for application, which uh, seems to have made that difficult for uh, certain sectors to access. And certain, uh, you only really get a sense of the sheer variety and different sets of circumstances of businesses when you create a scheme to try and, and support people. Then you find all of these uh, people that fall outside of it for a whole variety of different reasons. It's almost impossible in the timescales that we're trying to do this to devise something to catch everyone. But nonetheless, I had hoped that the £40 million hardship scheme would be the one that would, would capture all those who had fallen through the cracks. And it seems there are still people. So I'm willing to work uh, with the Department of the Economy to try and ensure that we give support where we can. The policy responsibility is the Department of the Economies. Uh, all we can do is give advice and assistance in relation to that. But clearly, we do not want to see a situation where people, just because of criteria, are genuinely involved in business, genuinely providing service to the community, and they do not get any assistance whatsoever. I call Claire Bailey. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Um, 
and I'm looking at the figures in the statement um, and those given by the communities minister previously, and just to sort of hope I've got my sums wrong. And if we're being, we know that it was £99 million scheme to cover a three month rate holiday for all businesses, so meaning that costs about £33 million per month. Um, now, as we go further and extend that for another month, I'm assuming that'll be another average of 33 million. And then the extension to some businesses of a rate-free financial year is a measure to try and save these businesses, which, of course, is very, very welcome. But given, and I'll go back to the, the stress on council, given that this is largely an income loss for councils who collect the rates, and the Communities Minister has only announced a £20.3 million package for councils for the next few months, it doesn't really add up. And I know that the Minister has made mention the councils can make savings, for example, by not funding community festivals that aren't happening. But I'd maybe like to ask the Minister what is being done to prevent councils from also facing um, going out of business and if there is any preparatory work happening within the executive to plan for the loss of these local institutions? No, I can assure the, the member this, the, 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 this is a loss of income uh, rather than a, an award of money. Uh, so it's a loss of income over the year, and, and, and quite clearly, probably some of the businesses, uh, uh, hopefully, that, that, that benefit from this will, will be able to stay open. Quite clearly, if there was no initiative taken in relation to rates, there may well be a loss of rates income anyway uh, to us. Uh, but we will absorb the cost of this. Uh, the, the executive are absorbing the cost of this uh, rate relief to the end of the year. It's not going to, the burden is not going to be placed on the councils. I call Jerry Carl. Thank you. Uh, one of the asked the Minister to expand upon the measures in place and those needed to protect and support workers at this time, particularly those who haven't been furloughed uh, and haven't, or haven't to visit food banks. Um, I mentioned before there's a pattern across the world where businesses to workers uh, being helped as a ratio of four to one, and it seems to be the case here with the minister um, announcing £700 million pounds support uh, for businesses uh, in relation to rates and grants, uh, but from his department, only £4 million uh, for sub teachers. Um, and I note uh, ar around the uh, rates relief, there's no rates relief uh, for workers. And obviously, support for the business community is clearly necessary at this time, but some feel that the measures uh, with no strings attached doesn't address the situation with some businesses uh, can, can receive uh, government assistance um, at the same time uh, laying off staff. So I wanted to ask the Minister, um, uh, workers are obviously, he will know, are central to the economy. Uh, can he comment on the lack of action supporting workers and what measures are in place to ensure that employers are supporting workers uh, at this time? Well, I can say the employee retention scheme is based on that. It's based on people holding on to their staff. Uh, that's, that's on the basis that they apply for it. The, the vast bulk of the, the money that we've given out are that £700 million to business. It's almost as a business as, as a separate section, and it's all fat cats who are getting this money into their back pocket. The vast bulk of that is going out to small and medium enterprises, which are the backbone of the economy here, which in themselves are earning a wage out of their businesses, and which in turn are employing huge amounts of local people in those businesses. So any support to business is not simply about somebody's profit margin. This is about keeping business alive, keeping the economy alive, keeping uh, workers in jobs uh, in relation to that. And so rates relief and things like that for the commercial sector are about keeping the doors open and keeping employees in place. That's the, the, the primary intention of all of this. It's not about gifts uh, to individual business owners, but actually about keeping the doors open. Uh, and so, the, as I say, the furlough scheme, the uh, the intention of that is, and the, the, perp, the, the basis on which people apply, are to keep employees in place, uh, and I think that's very important in the time ahead. We recognise that the economy is going to suffer as a consequence of this. Uh, of course, those, those workers who are in public sector employment are, are getting their wages, but we recognise that the economy is going to suffer as a consequence, and more interventions will be required. We, as it stands currently, have a limited ability to make those interventions. If there are further interventions that come from London, then we will obviously try and use them as wisely as we can to sustain the economy that is made up here uh, and have the maximum effect in relation to that. But that focus is, is when we focus on business, it is about keeping business and workers in place and keeping people in jobs. That's the primary effort of it. There's only one more member to ask the question on this occasion. Uh, and I would invite other members who wish to ask a further question to rise in their place for a short period if they have a burning question. Uh, I would hope with your cooperation to finish this side of the lunchtime one o'clock break. I call Jim Allister. Um, could I very much welcome the 
uh, relief that's been secured for the substitute teachers. That was an inequity long needing to be addressed, uh, and that is good. Uh, I was hoping, though it's not his own responsibility, that in liaison with the Department of the Economy there might have been some good news for the haulage sector. But what I really wanted to ask the Minister was this. I want to better understand the Treasury rules and the departmental approach to furloughing in the public sector, because I think he's already said the Treasury frowns upon it, maybe to put it at its mildest. Yet we have councils who have had authority to furlough. Could he explain how that works and what are the rules about that? Well, uh, firstly, in relation to the haulage sector, I know there was a significant piece of work undertaken between our discussions undertaken between the Department of Infrastructure, uh, Economy, and I think the Department of Transport in London in relation to that sector. And it was concluded that there wasn't an intervention necessary at this time. Uh, I, I don't have the detail as to why, but I know part of the transportation money that we had been holding back was in anticipation of a request in that area, and it, which didn't emerge, and we went ahead then with the allocation uh, to TransLink. Uh, I, as, as far as I understand, and, and he'll forgive me if I'm, I'm, I'm repeating these incorrectly, and I will get advice that we have got from Treasury to him uh, in relation to this, that the, the, the Treasury were initially very reluctant to furlough public sector workers, and uh, in, in, I suppose on the grounds that they end up paying twice for them perhaps. Uh, but they did concede that, that in, in cases where those workers could not be redeployed elsewhere, where there was a loss of income associated with them not doing their jobs to that public sector area, and there was a third rule which escapes me at the moment, uh, and they had to satisfy those criteria. Now, our responsibility in relation to that is to provide advice to the other departments uh, and say this is the broad view of Treasury. If you have a, a sector or an arm's length body within your department, uh, and you think you might be able to avail of this, and it will save you in terms of the ongoing loss you have. Councils are a particular example in relation to that. Uh, I think there are a number of, of uh, uh, I think museums might be another sector which, which have furloughed workers, and I, I'm, I'm sure I could also get them the information of what sectors have been furloughed to date. Uh, but councils, I think, did come forward in relation, particularly leisure centre workers uh, that couldn't be redeployed elsewhere, but that the council was losing revenue as a consequence of them not being able to work. And the reason that they were not being able to work was because of the restrictions as a consequence of the pandemic. So it, 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 there are guidelines, our rules and regulations in relation to that. We give advice to the various departments and say, These are the, this is what Treasury is telling us. If you think that you have a sector within your department or an arm's length body that might uh, fit this uh, approach, then come back uh, to us or go directly to Treasury and make your application. And obviously, in some cases, some councils have have met that criteria and have been able to furlough workers and have been able to save uh, a cost to the council as a consequence of that. And in a number uh, of areas of departments have also been able to do the same. So I'm happy to provide that detail to him uh, and the actual rules that the Treasury have given us in relation to that. I call Cahill Boylan. Thanks for letting me in again. And I really appreciate what the Minister has put out today in relation to the statement. And I know a lot of schemes are covering a lot of groups, but I have to say, Minister, I'm still getting lobbied. Um, from the infrastructure side in relation to the taxis industry, and they feel they've been left short in this. I'm just wondering what discussions has there been at the executive level, and what ministers have made an approach for support for the uh, taxis industry? Well, I can say there's been no specific uh, proposition put forward in relation to taxi drivers uh, to, to myself, that I, and I'm not aware of any being put forward in the executive context. Uh, I know there was some suggestion that taxi drivers might meet with some of the self-employed schemes, uh, but I'm, I'm not certain how that has played out because they aren't a, a sector that would be within my own sort of departmental remit. Uh, so uh, I, I do hear occasionally uh, from people uh, remarking in, in relation to them. So, but there has been no specific scheme put forward for to seek support for them to me. Uh, but perhaps they have been able to avail, as I say, of the self-employed scheme. I call Mark Durkin for a brief question. Uh, thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. In, in response to my previous question, uh, the, the Minister alluded to some of the convoluted uh, situations that have arisen that have prevented uh, businesses getting assistance. But in regard to some of the rates based assistance that has been out there and has been, been very welcome, there are a number of people who still haven't been able to access that. The deadline is looming, it's imminent, in, in, in fact, and LPS. There seems to have been an issue with a lot of these people's payment details, their account details, and the LPS denying having uh, details when, and in the fact, question? They, they, they have been given to them in some 
cases four or five times. Can the Minister have a look at extending the deadline for people in that sort of situation? Well, I, 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 my belief is that the, uh, once the application is in the system, it has met the deadline. So it's not the deadline for uh, if you haven't received your money by this week, you're not getting it. Uh, so if the application is in the system. There have been anomalies, uh, all sorts of anomalies in relation to and, and I'm sure, like yourself, I have it. Uh, frequent people who have come directly to me, uh, to I, I pass them into LPS to get a response to them. So, if the member has any particular examples of businesses, uh, I have to say LPS have been very proactive in terms of the response, and I, I've heard that uh, outside of the department, people have been uh, have been appraised, praising off them for uh, the, the, the quickness of response in relation to some of these matters. Some of them are very complex and difficult to resolve, and if information is missing, sometimes it's hard to get that. But uh, can I say to them, if there are particular instances, uh, by all means, contact directly LPS as an elected representative, and you will get a response. I call Andrew Muir for a brief question. Thank you very much, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I was very concerned about the response in relation to the logistics package. There's lots of local hauliers were holding out for that support, and just to see if that money is still being held there as the match funding to go with the Department for Transport, or if that hope is now evaporated because a number of businesses now are really worried about their future. If this is the case, because it's potential closure for them. Uh, well, I, I can only report what was reported to me. I was holding, in, uh, as by agreement of the executive, some £95 million for transportation issues. We allocated some of that to the airports, to the ports. The infrastructure minister had a uh, bid in in relation to Translink, uh, and there was uh, ongoing discussions, I, uh, I understand, between infrastructure, economy and transport in London in relation to that requirement of that sector, and I'm told then there was no... Uh, case been put forward uh, in relation to that. So why that was the case, I don't have the detail of that. But uh, there is, just to assure him, if, if that should arise, there's a, uh, as I said in my statement, there's 60 million still being held in relation to transportation part. And that is the end of questions to the Minister of Finance on a statement. The Business Committee has arranged to meet after 1 p.m. today. I propose, therefore, by leave of the Assembly, to suspend the setting until 2 p.m. The first item of business when we return will be the health protection